Good evening, everyone. At least it's evening here in the Eastern Time Zone uh, in Pittsburgh. Welcome to this annual event to celebrate Constitution Day at Carnegie Mellon University. My name's Keith Webster. I'm the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean of University Libraries. And with my dear friend, Gina Casolino, um, I'm honored to co-host this evening's event. We're here because any college that receives federal funding is required to offer programming to students and the wider community to honor Constitution Day. And since 2005, the University Libraries and the Division of Student Affairs have come together to present a series of lectures to fulfill our obligations and celebrate the Constitution. We deeply value our ongoing partnership with the Division of Student Affairs and with the Alumni Association to produce this event. I particularly wish to acknowledge my thanks to the Posner Foundation and the Posner family for entrusting Carnegie Mellon University Libraries with the care and use of the Posner Collection, and most particularly, a very rare copy of the Bill of Rights, about which more in a few moments. I'm also grateful to Sonia Wellington, our events manager, who looked after all of the logistics for this evening's event, and Shannon Riff, our Associate Dean for External Relations in the University Libraries. I do hope Shannon is not with us this evening. She had a baby on Friday last week. Our warmest good wishes to her and her family on that wonderful event. I'm also grateful to our speaker this evening, Professor Doug Coulson, who I'll introduce in just a few moments. Um, Lenny Chan, the Director of the Office of Community Standards and Integrity, who will moderate the question and answer part of this evening's event. And of course, Gina, Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, who will offer some closing remarks. I mentioned the Bill of Rights. And in the Posner Collection, we have access to one of only four extant copies of the very first printing of the US Bill of Rights and its ratifications. Um, my colleague, Dr. Sam Lemley, curator of special collections, would be happy to talk with anyone who would like to learn more about our copy of the Bill of Rights. But to act as a bit of a teaser, Sam has prepared a brief video to let you know more about the Bill of Rights. So with a bit of magic, I hope that somebody somewhere will hit play and you'll be able to enjoy Sam's presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Lemley. I'm the curator of special collections at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And tonight I'll be sharing something from the collection with you in introduction to tonight's event. So this is, I think, uh, one of the most remarkable things in Special Collections at CMU. It's a printed pamphlet. It's about 11 inches tall. And at some point in the past, it was actually removed from its original binding. And you can see that there are some small uh, fragments of that original binding spine on the pamphlet's left-hand edge. Uh, you can also see that there's a small stain in the upper right portion of the first page and the outer leaves, right, the first and last pages that kind of serve as the pamphlet's binding in the absence of um, the original binding uh, are noticeably darker and kind of stained. And that suggests that it's actually been in this disbound condition for some time uh, and was probably handled in this condition for you know the centuries um, that it was in circulation before coming to CMU. So uh, on the first page of the document, about a third of the way down, uh, is the article or the uh, document's title, and that's articles in addition to an amendment of uh, the Constitution of the United States of America. Um, of course, this is a copy of the American Bill of Rights. Um, it was printed in Philadelphia by Special Commission in January or February 1792. And this particular copy was purchased by Henry Posner Sr. in 1963 and was later deposited um, with the libraries along with the rest of the Posner Memorial Collection uh, by Henry Posner's son and family. So given the appearance of this document, it usually surprises visitors to special collections uh, to learn that this is one of the rarest documentary artifacts that we have. Um, and in fact, it actually might be the rarest 
uh, single item we hold. Uh, only five copies, including this one, are known to survive. So that's, that's a vanishingly small survival rate um, given the size of the original edition, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but you know, apart from its rarity, uh, what's fascinating about this document is that this printing uh, of the Bill of Rights uh, it wasn't fully unprecedented, right? This was not the first time uh, that the constitutional amendments that would become the Bill of Rights uh, had been printed. In fact, they had been put into circulation fairly early, uh, usually in the form of newspapers or broadsides, um, you know, as early as 1789, uh, which was immediately after uh, they were approved by Congress uh, and sent to the states for debate uh, for ratification. Um, so what does make, or uh, what, what did make this uh, particular printing of the Bill of Rights important and groundbreaking, uh, then, is the context of its printing. Uh, and remember that it was printed likely in January or February 1792, in other words, immediately after Virginia became the 11th and final state to ratify on December 15th, um, 1791. Um, and it was Virginia's vote that met the requirement that uh, three-fourths of states ratify any proposed amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and remember, too, at this point in American history, there were only 14 states, and the Constitution itself was fewer than five years old. Um, so this document that I'm holding, um, you know, putting it differently, is uh, it's the first form of the Bill of Rights that could claim the force of law, and the first time that its 10 uh, articles appeared in print as an integral part of the United States Constitution. Uh, and for this reason, constitutional scholars uh, and scholars of American history uh, refer to this document, this printing, as the official, the first official Bill of Rights. Um, so instead of merely listing the ratified amendments, though, it also records the kind of legal deliberation and legislative compromise that led to ratification. So, you know, in a sense, uh, embedded in this document is the story of the contentious origin uh, of the American Bill of Rights. And I think the best and most basic evidence for this is the fact that it lists 12 uh, amendments rather than the more familiar 10. Uh, and what many don't know is that of the 12 amendments that were originally proposed in 1789, uh, only amendments 3 through 12 were ratified to become part of the Constitution. So, you know, for example, our First Amendment, which protects uh, the freedoms of speech, uh, religion, assembly, and the press, was actually the third, right, in the original form of those 12 uh, articles. So um, besides that, though, beneath the printed amendments, uh, beginning on page three, appears a kind of roll call of states, um, recording how each state voted on the question of ratification. Um, and I find this fascinating because it turns out that the bulk of the Posner Bill of Rights, you know, actually isn't the Bill of Rights at all. Um, you know, the amendments take up only one leaf or two pages out of 12, um, you know, but otherwise most of the document is given over to kind of an enumerative record of legislative bureaucracy. Um, so I'm going to show Pennsylvania's vote on screen here, which appears on page nine. And Pennsylvania was one of the last states to submit its vote on ratification. Uh, and you can see that that uh, vote is dated September 21st, 1791, or about three months before Virginia's deciding vote. So after Virginia's vote to ratify was submitted to the federal government, Thomas Jefferson, who was then Secretary of State, commissioned the printing of this edition, um, and 135 copies were made and distributed to the 14 state legislatures um, to ensure that they had ha uh, the sort of official and approved language of the amendments on file. Um, so that's that's a very almost painfully brief documentary history of the Bill of Rights that only brings us to about 1792, 1793. Uh, but I want to end with the observation, um, or, or sort of by looking forward, right, with the observation that this copy of the Bill of Rights offers a number of important lessons 
uh, most of which are still very much alive today. You know, famously, Thomas Jefferson called the Constitution uh, a good canvas in need of some retouching. Uh, and I think revisiting this document reminds us that the American experiment is uh, maybe always a good canvas in need of some retouching. You know, and that's that's part of its power and part of its beauty. Um, you know, after all, this particular copy of the Posner or the Posner Bill of Rights um, you know, lacks all the so-called Reconstruction Amendments, including the 13th Amendment, which effectively ended slavery in the United States, uh, and the 14th and 15th Amendments, which respectively extended uh, the rights of citizenship and the right to vote to recently emancipated enslaved people. Um, so, you know, with that idea, uh, kind of offered an introduction, I would invite all of you, anyone, to reach out uh, to me with questions about Special Collections or the Posner Bill of Rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, as always, Sam, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, if anyone would like to know more about Sam's work and see some of his other recordings, there are a series of um, videos and presentations available on the CMU Libraries YouTube channel. So please do look out for those if Sam has um, captured your interest. Um, let me also repeat again um, our deepest thanks to the Posner Fine Arts Foundation for having the trust in us to look after the remarkable Posner collection. I'm, as always, especially grateful to Anne Malloy, the executive director of the foundation and a member of the CMU Board of Trustees for her support and encouragement. And so to the main event this evening, and it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor Doug Coulson, Associate Professor of English at Carnegie Mellon. Doug teaches in the areas of legal rhetoric, argument, and the history of rhetoric. Before entering academic life, he practiced business and commercial litigation for nearly a decade and remains a licensed attorney in Texas. He is the author of Race, Nation and Refuge, the Rhetoric of Race in Asian American Citizenship Cases, published by SUNY Press in 2017. And his forthcoming book, Judicial Rhapsodies, Rhetoric and Fundamental Rights in the Supreme Court will be published by Amherst College Press next year. This evening, he has offered us the title Keeping Government Out of Religion and Vice Versa, Metaphor, Figurality and the First Amendment's Religion Clauses. Without further ado, I am going to hand over to Doug and invite him to deliver his presentation. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I first want to thank the university libraries and the organizers of tonight's event for inviting me to speak uh, and for their effort in preparing the event, particularly uh, Shannon, Sonia, um, Brian, uh, Lenny, Sam, Dean Webster, and Dean Casalania. And thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about the use of metaphors and figurality in interpretations of the Constitution, particularly in the Establishment and Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, if I can get this going. Uh, so you can see the full uh, text of the First Amendment here. The Establishment Clause, which bars laws respecting an establishment of religion, and the free exercise clause, which bars those prohibit, which bars laws prohibiting the free exercise of religion, form the first words of the First Amendment and therefore the first words of the Bill of Rights. United States Supreme Court Justice Wiley Rutledge once wrote that for James Madison, who was primarily responsible for drafting the Bill of Rights, the two clauses represented correlative and coextensive ideas representing only different facets of a single great and fundamental freedom, that of freedom of conscience or belief. The two clauses are collectively referred to as the religion clauses. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has interpreted, interpreted these clauses through a series of conspicuous metaphors. At various times, different justices have written that the clauses represent an imperfect line 
a scale in which religion and government are balanced, a boundary designed to avoid excessive entanglements, a tightrope to be traversed, and a blurred, indistinct, and variable barrier. Most famously, though, is the metaphor of the clauses representing a wall of separation between church and state. Judge Daniel Thomas of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Alabama wrote in 1966 that no constitutional principle is more firmly embedded in our history than what Thomas Jefferson termed the wall of separation between church and state, a principle that Judge Thomas wrote was fundamental to our liberty. The metaphor of a wall of separation or wall metaphor is most commonly attributed to Jefferson's 1802 letter to the Danbury, uh, Connecticut Baptist Association, in which he wrote that, the, that he revered the religion clauses for building a wall of separation between church and state. The phrase may also have been inspired by early American sources, such as the Puritan minister Roger Williams' uh, 1644 letter to John Cotton, and the metaphor of a protective hedge or wall was common in the rhetoric of colonial New England. According to R. Freeman Butts, the words separation of church and state are an accurate and convenient shorthand for the First Amendment itself. And the words have become, as Daniel Dreisbach writes, more familiar to the American people than the actual text of the First Amendment. Although Supreme Court justices with widely divergent opinions on separationism used the wall metaphor in early religion clause cases, the court was almost never comfortable with the sweeping and rigid implications. It was immediately questioned even by justices who strongly favored separationism, and the metaphor is largely disfavored and unused in constitutional interpretation today. Even in public discourse, while we still talk about the separation of church and state, the idea that a wall separates them is less common. In early critiques of the wall metaphor, some justices also questioned the entire idea of using metaphorical language to interpret the religion clauses. The court first began applying the establishment clause uh, to the states through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment in 1947. In McCollum v. Board of Education, uh, decided the year after Everson, Justice Stanley Reed objected to the wall metaphor by declaring that a rule of law should not be drawn from a figure of speech. <clears throat> Although Reed's declaration itself ironically combines the metaphor drawn with the parallelism of rule of law and figure of speech, it participates in a larger attitude toward metaphor embodied in modern language policies which sought to eliminate all forms of amplification, figurality, and stylistic embellishment in favor of a plain style of speech often aligned with mathematics and distinguished from poetry. In the 16th century, metaphors and figures such as various forms of repetition uh, of ideas across texts or the repetition of sound or meaning on the level of sentences and clauses were at least viewed as necessary stylistic embellishments to give speech the persuasive aura of aristocracy in an aristocratic society. But by the 17th century, the English philosopher John Locke wrote that all the artificial and figurative application of words that eloquence has invented merely insinuate wrong ideas and are perfect cheats. Metaphor and figurality frustrated the clarity and precision to which early modern reformers aspired in their effort to recognize only those truths discoverable by deductive logic and the scientific method. The modern aspiration for mathematical precision in language has impacted legal discourse no less than other domains of language. Modern legal discourse often promotes the idea that it belongs to a technical domain of language that is complete autonomous and hermetic, unaffected by culture, politics, or rhetorical considerations. 
And in a democratic legal system, you do, of course, want the law to be as determinable and accessible as possible in keeping with the dispersal of power that forms the basis of democracy, rather than permit a small number of elites to wield secret knowledge of the law. <clears throat> the question is what form that accessibility takes and what limits natural language itself uh, sets to legal determinacy. But contemporary studies across a variety of disciplines have long recognized that metaphors and figures come from the same tradition and that both carry argumentative rather than merely stylistic importance. Uh, the rhetorical scholar Jean Fonestock writes, for example, that metaphor and figurality both belong in the pragmatic or situational and functional dimension of language and open a window on a fundamental generative cognitive process. <laughs> Figures are not merely expressive, Fonestock notes, but form a verbal summary that epitomizes a line of reasoning, a condensed or even diagram-like rendering of the relationship among a set of terms. The legal scholar Maximilian Del Mar recognizes both metaphors and figures as important artifacts of legal inquiry, uh, forms of language that signal their own artifice and call upon us to participate in legal thought, enabling and sustaining inquiry in important ways. Delmar notes that figures are highly memorable, making them more likely to be reused, perhaps because they resonate uh, kinesically as a form of gesture and invite our interaction with them. Similarly, the constitutional scholar Robert Tsai writes that the power of judicial metaphor is furthered by the fact that its moving quality tends to find reception in a wider circulation in later opinions and secondary media which increases the chance that it will be appropriated by others. He notes that the metaphorical content of judicial opinions plays an important role in the construction of the political imagination with the potential to cultivate political intimacy or a sense of affinity among citizens, a regenerative power with the capacity to level and legitimate the law. The wall of separation metaphor was first cited by the Supreme Court in, the 19, in a 19th century polygamy case, but its power as a means of understanding the religion clauses and the controversy surrounding the metaphor really began with Justice Hugo Black's opinion in the 1947 case of Everson v. Board of Education. In Everson, Black wrote that the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state, uh, which must be kept high and impregnable, preventing even the slightest breach. The Everson case was a landmark Supreme Court case involving a New Jersey bus voucher program that reimbursed parents for money they spent on transportation. The case inaugurated the most substantial body of religion clause jurisprudence by recognizing the rights reflected in the court's religion clauses or sorry, in the religion clauses as fundamental rights that applied not only to the federal government, but to state governments through the 14th Amendment. As developed in American law, the doctrine of fundamental rights has recognized that certain rights are so implicit in the concept of ordered liberty that restrictions on them must be regarded with heightened scrutiny. It has particularly emerged in the extension of the Bill of Rights to state governments through the incorporation or absorption of uh, the most important guarantees of the Bill of Rights into the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, because the Bill of Rights itself only directly limits the power of the federal government. In the 1937 case of Palco v. Connecticut, the court first formulated the doctrine under which guarantees in the Bill of Rights could be accepted or rejected as fundamental based on whether they were implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. More recently and controversially, the current court has asserted that for a right to be fundamental, it must also be deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. <clears throat> Despite the recency of these developments, a legal scholar Milton Convitz explains that the process 
of identifying some rights and liberties that enjoy more dignity or have a higher rank than others and therefore deserve more protection can be traced to the early years of the American colonies. James Madison first identified certain rights as preeminently important natural rights. Speaking of the great rights, the trial by jury, freedom of the press, and liberty of conscience, while more reluctantly recognizing other guarantees in the Bill of Rights. Madison initially opposed the entire idea of a Bill of Rights because he thought the enumeration of rights was unnecessary and inconsistent with the idea of popular rights. But he eventually supported the enumeration of certain rights in response to a public outcry for a Bill of Rights and due to the uh, usefulness of uh, constitutional enumeration to certain rights in public debate. Uh, producing a discursive commitment to certain rights in a solemn manner, Madison concluded, so that they became incorporated with the national sentiment, could promote political acculturation and be a good ground for an appeal to the sense of the community. For Madison, in other words, the compelling purpose of the Bill of Rights was not its strictly legal efficacy, but its power to shape the beliefs, desires, and ethical commitments of the American people in support of a rights-based order. Only one year after Justice Black wrote of the high and impregnable wall in Everson, the court held in McCollum v. Board of Education in 1948, that an Illinois school program in which students were released from their secular classes on a voluntary basis during school hours to attend religious instruction was an unconstitutional establishment of religion. These were so-called uh, released time programs. In McCollum, not only did Justice Reed object that a rule of law should not be drawn from a figure of speech, but even justices who concurred in the decision expressed misgivings about the wall metaphor. Justice Felix Frankfurter uh, concluded his concurring opinion in McCollum on a poignant note, for example, by alluding to Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, writing that if nowhere else, in the relation between church and state, good fences make good neighbors. Frankfurter's qualifying phrase, if nowhere else, and the aphorist, aphoristic saying, good fences make good neighbors from Frost's poem, gesture to his discomfort with the metaphor. The opening line of Frost's poem, something there is that doesn't love a wall, <clears throat> which is also repeated near the end of the poem, is as famous as the poem's final line, good fences make good neighbors. The neighbor in Frost's poem who tells the narrator good fences make good neighbors is also portrayed as a dark and en enigmatic figure. Justice Robert Jackson expressed similar misgivings about the wall metaphor in his concurring opinion in McCollum. And Jackson wrote that the court was likely to make the legal wall of separation between church and state as winding and as the famous serpentine wall uh, designed by Mr. Jefferson for the university he founded, referring to the famous Serpentine Wall of the University of Virginia. <clears throat> Jackson also waxed eloquent about the potentially, sorry, potentially irresolvable nature of the relationship between church and state, <clears throat> writing that perhaps subjects such as mathematics, physics, or chemistry are or can be completely secularized, but it would not seem practical to teach other practice or appreciation of the arts if we are to forbid exposure of youth to any religious influences, music without sacred music, architecture minus the cathedral or painting without the scriptural themes would be eccentric and incomplete, even from a secular point of view. In the 1952 case of Zorak v. Clausen, Jackson also wrote that the wall which the court was professing to erect between church and state has become even more warped and twisted than I expected. After the court explored various metaphors over the years, in the 1971 case of Lemon v. Kurtzman, Chief Justice Warren Burger summed up the court's interpretation of the religion clauses. 
he recognized that the language of the clauses was not precisely stated, but at best opaque. And that total separation of church and state was not possible in an absolute sense. He, he concluded that the line of separation far from being a wall is a blurred indistinct, and variable barrier depending on all the circumstances of a particular relationship. The court formulated a three-part test in Lemon to determine the degree or extent of the relationship between church and state in particular scenarios. So what I wanna do with uh, focus on with the remainder of my time is uh, a, a different figure that appears in early uh, religion clause cases. In contrast to the wall metaphor, another figure is pervasive both in Madison's thought about the religion clauses and in the court's early religion clause jurisprudence. And this figure anticipates, I argue, uh, the court's position in Lemon. Specifically, the figure of chiasmus often appears in Madison's thought and in the court's early religion clause cases, exemplified here in Justice Jackson's expression of the relationship between the religion clauses in his dissenting opinion in Everson as one intended not only to keep the state's hands out of religion, but to keep religion's hands off the state. As a figure of thought or arrangement, the term chiasmus derives from the Greek letter chi represented by an X, referring to the transposition or crossing. Chiasmus is used to refer to any inverted parallelism or repetition of ideas or grammatical structures in reverse order, a repetition in reverse, essentially without larger, uh, whether across larger portions of a text or an entire text or distilled stylistically in the sort of inverted bicolon reflected in Jackson's descent in Everson. When words are repeated in reverse order at the level of inverted clauses, particularly in a bicolon such as Jackson's, a specific variety of chiasmas known as antimetaboly is formed, sometimes uh, expressed in shorthand by the Latin phrase vice versa. Justice Black, for example, wrote in Everson that neither a state nor the federal government can openly or secretly participate in the affairs of any religious organizations or groups and vice versa. The inverted parallelism reflected in the figure of chiasmus has an ancient lineage that predates the appearance, its appearance in Greek rhetoric, appearing much earlier in Sumero-Akkadian and Eucharitic texts from the third millennium before the common era, as well as in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. The figure is common in ancient rhetoric, poetics, and wisdom literature. Rodolphe Gashi writes that far from representing a mere style, stylistic figure, chiasmus is one of the earliest forms of thought, an originary form that allows the drawing apart and the bringing together of opposite functions or terms and entwines them within an identity of movements while infinitely deferring closure through the substitutability implied by its asymmetry. According to Robert Harriman, chiasmus moves one toward a center that proves to be empty, a space only for crossing, a movement that ultimately uh, lends itself to mystification. Among famous examples of chiasmus, the Greek uh, sophist Gorgias of Leontini famously advised debaters that when their opponent was serious, they should use humor, and when their opponent uses humor, uh, they should be serious. The figure has also served as an important organizing principle for philosophical and legal thought. In the famous Taoist allegory of transformation, the ancient Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi writes that after waking from a dream in which he was a butterfly, he questioned whether he was really a man dreaming of being a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming of being a man. In legal thought, Cicero writes that a magistrate is a speaking law and a law is a silent magistrate. And Justice Jackson once famous, famously wrote that the Supreme Court is not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible only because we are final. 
<clears throat> the relationship between church and state is prevalently expressed through the figure of chiasmus, both in Madison's 1785 tract, Remonstrance and Memorial Against Re Religious Assessments, which is widely viewed as a precursor to the religion clauses and on which many of the court's justices relied in early cases, uh, as well as in the court's early religion clause jurisprudence itself. In Madison's remonstrance, uh, chiasms appear prominently both in the language and structure of the document. The remonstrance consists of 15 paragraphs, which structurally form a single chiasmus centered around the eighth paragraph, itself containing two chiasms on the sentence level. This figurality also seems to reflect a broader tendency in Madison toward eloquent moderation and harmony. In the central paragraph of the remonstrance, Madison indicts religious establishment as in some cases erecting a spiritual tyranny on the ruins of civil authority and in others upholding the thrones of political tyranny. This chiastic movement depicts religious establishment as either religion exploiting government or government exploiting religion. The paragraph concludes with the chiasmus that a just government protects its citizens in their religious freedom, no less than in their property, neither invading the equal rights of any sect nor offering any sect to invade nor suffering any sect to invade those of another. The claim of the central paragraph of Madison's remonstrance that a just government protects religious freedom no less than property is also expressed in more explicitly chiastic form in Madison's 1792 essay on property. In that essay, he writes that as a man is said to have a right to his property, he may equally be said to have a property in his rights. He then repeats the initial chiasmus in the final sentence of the essay, if the United States mean to uh, obtain or deserve the full praise due to wise and just governments, they will equally respect the rights of property and the property and rights. If Madison cannot be characterized as what is called a chiastic personality in which chi chiasmus is so central uh, to his thought that it, it practically constitutes a psych psychological condition. It was at least central to his thinking about rights and about religious freedom in particular. In the court's early religion clause cases, justices not only drew on Madison's chiasms, but revealed a propensity to use the figure themselves. In addition to the examples I've already cited, and Justice Frankfurter quoted these two chiasms from the American lawyer and judge, Jeremiah Black and McCollum, the manifest object of the men who framed the institutions of this country was to have a state without religion and a church without politics. Our fathers seem to have been perfectly sincere in their belief that the members of the church would be more patriotic and the citizens of the state more religious by keeping their respective functions entirely separate. In Lemon, uh, Chief Justice Berger wrote that despite the difficulty of discovering the right balance between church and state, the history of many countries attests to the hazards of religions intruding into the political arena or of political power intruding into the legitimate and free exercise of religious belief. And that government is to be entirely excluded from the area of religious instruction and churches excluded from the affairs of government. The figure of chiasmus not only in, entwines opposing functions or terms in an identity of movements, but as Robert Harriman notes, it is fundamentally a figure of social interaction. The philosopher Emmanuel Levinas describes a pleasure of contact at the heart of the chiasm. And Harriman writes that the social dimension activates the cognitive reciprocity of interpersonal exchange prior to all other social patterning. It is precisely analogous to the visual experience of looking at another person or at one's mirror image, an experience of doubling which depends on both proximity and distance and on there being empty space between one and one's double. 
Gene Fostock explains that chiasmus can suggest mutual constitution as one term so depends on the other, it does not matter which comes first. An indifference displays syntactically in the syntax of the figure. This leads to a relationship more aligned with perpetual abeyance or deferral than obstruction, one that, according to Harriman, does not allow one to settle on either side of the equation. It is used when what needs to be said eludes representation. Chiasmus itself supplies no principle of resolution, Harriman writes, but rather perpetual oscillation, a ping-ponging back and forth like a small prison house of language. I conclude from this comparison of the misgivings about the wall metaphor, uh, almost from its inception, and the prevalence of chiasmus that surrounds interpretations of the religion clauses, that the clauses represent more uh, chiasmus of church and state than a wall with important differences. <clears throat> the prevalence of chiasmus in Madison's thought and in the court's early religion clause cases serves to interpret the clauses as less stable than Everson's high and impregnable wall, signifying instead a perpetual oscillation between church and state that eludes precise representation and infinitely deferred closure that does not allow one to settle on either side of the equation. Evo Strecker describes the potential of chiasmus to shatter expectations and conventions, which forms its rhetorical energy and leads to both pleasure and pain, as the figure first shatters expectations, but ultimately fails to gain lasting adherence because it provides no principle of resolution. While Madison's sententious chiasms may have shattered expectations in his struggle for religious liberty, in the 19th century. In the court's early religion clause jurisprudence, they led only to the small prison house of language that Robert Harriman describes. The blurred, indistinct, and variable barrier of lemon, in other words, was incipient in the chiasms of Everson and in Madison's remonstrance, in which the justices in Everson drew uh, fairly heavily, as well as in the continuing prevalence of the figure between Everson and Lemon. The figure magnified the value of both church and state without privileging either a peon to both religion uh, and secular life, which proved more durable than the obstruction symbolized by a wall. The figure simultaneously represents both attract, attraction and aloofness, uh, a relationship that, for better or worse, leaves substantial room for interpretive debate. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug, for that informative and timely presentation. As we transition to the question and answer, part of tonight's program, just as a reminder that you can submit questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. So Doug, uh, we got a, a great interesting question to start with. So do you think that political party affiliations with certain religions violates the founding fathers ideals? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Do you think that political party affiliations with certain religions, or I would say religious views, violates the Founding Fathers' ideals? I, uh, I'm not uh, enough of a historian to know the, uh, what uh, the founders really would have thought of that. My, my instinct is uh, probably not. I think they, um, they were somewhat libertarian, really, about the question. And so, you know, in terms of um, partisanship today, I think it is very complicated uh, when parties openly uh, espouse a particular set of religious beliefs. It simply calls uh, into question whether they can be trusted to set those aside when, when they're governing. Great. Thank you. Um, so this next question is a little lengthy, so I'm going to make sure that I, that I get it right for you. It starts off with, hi, Doug, thanks for this talk. This was very interesting and quite a Quite a bit I didn't know. I'm struck by how chiasmus in the strict separation of a wall seems to create such a sharp divide. That is, there seems to be no space for recognition of the necessary overlap given the facts that many voters in a democracy 
understand their lives via church or religion. I'm wondering if you can comment some on whether you think this creates an unrealistic divide and if that's a bad thing. I will, yeah, I'll try to, to answer the question as, as best I can understand it. I, I, um, I think it's interesting that, that Madison uh, was so cynical as the drafter of the Bill of Rights of its of its potential for legal efficacy. And I wonder if that didn't even potentially lead to um, a certain way of, of writing it. He, he was clearly, according to his own statements, uh, intending it to, to foster a sort of culture of rights. He, he felt that in, in a time of emergency, maybe this was very prescient on his part, but that in a time of emergency, nobody would pay attention to it anyway. Um, so, you know, I think of the, this particularly with regard to the religion clauses and this idea of chiasmus as a kind of mystifying figure uh, and that being deeply embedded in his own thought as to whether that um, was not a, a kind of irresolution uh, that he, he was fully aware it represented and he didn't think it, it could be uh, resolved with any kind of precision. I think in terms of uh, today's situation with religion, that this irresolution, if you accept the argument, leads to a, a situation where uh, trust in the Supreme Court becomes fairly important. And uh, today, for example, the Supreme Court's approval ratings are apparently as low uh, as they have ever been. So I think in many ways, both the political branches and uh, the populace has been a little bit comfortable with the court just sort of sifting it out through the common law process on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but uh, potentially incendiary politics can erupt, uh, in, you know, in sh short order uh, if you don't have uh, some stable way of, of resolving those issues. I'm not sure if that answers the, the question or not. Yeah, I think it gets at, at the root of the question. So thank you for that. So do you think the current religious makeup of the Supreme Court is operative as a factor in the outcomes of recent cases? That's a, a kind of speculation I, I would like to engage in. What I think, you know, as an, as an attorney in, in legal ethics, the appearance of impropriety uh, is, is an important category that's legally recognized. Right? And, and I think of that when I think of the court and its legitimacy, which is, again, you know, even more important when you have some very indeterminate constitutional provision that people feel uh, very passionately about. And so it does concern me, the, the sort of religious, you know, makeup of the court as, as we understand it uh, being uh, imbalanced just simply because of the, the appearance. Uh, but whether or not that actually determines uh, the outcome of their votes, I, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. So do you believe that the current Supreme Court is the most polarized it has ever been? Uh, again, not a Supreme Court historian, but yes, uh, I think it's extremely polarized. Uh, let's put it that way. I think, um, I think the concern a lot of people have is that uh, this court, judging from the last term, seems to be in a hurry. Uh, to change a lot of things. And, and that's uh, a judicial temperament that I don't think people are, are used to. Okay, great. So uh, Dean Webster mentioned in your intro that you have a book coming out next year. Have the recent major rulings of the court forced you to re-examine or revisit any of your writing or research? Excellent question, and the answer is yes, to an extent. Um, so uh, that was not a very happy experience <laughs> for me with everything changing. So particularly the Dobbs opinion, the new uh, abortion ruling, uh, which touches on the fundamental rights doctrine and, and suggests at least to a lot of legal commentators that more may be coming. Uh, I had to delay you know, my final draft to wait and see what the court said. I ultimately do some brief analysis of the case. It lends itself uh, to what I 
I'm talking about in the book, which is more about a particularly uh, effusive register of, of impassioned uh, argument in Supreme Court opinions around fundamental rights. So my book doesn't really depend upon uh, the status of the fundamental rights doctrine, but I, I did have to wait and at least see what they said. Yeah. So good principles of government can coincide with moral principles offered by religion. Are we a nation of good principles that happen to be found in religion? Or are we a nation founded on religious principles that happen to be generalizable to secular thinking? That was a beautiful chiasmus right there. <laughs> I didn't write that. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's both in, in a certain way. Uh, what did interest me in looking at the religion clauses in this way is in Madison's remonstrance, uh, I can't recall the exact language, but he uh, sort of privileges uh, the sovereignty of uh, religious conscience uh, over um, secular faith and loyalty to secular authority. Uh, so I think that uh, our history has allowed both in certain ways and tracing, you know, a single origin for that, I, I think is um, not the best way to look at it. I think it's a kind of chicken and egg uh, question and there's a process and, and a relationship. Okay. Now, I know, Doug, you mentioned earlier that you're not a Supreme Court historian, but and and you probably don't want to speculate, but I do find this question very interesting. What do you think Thomas Jefferson and James Madison would think of today's Supreme Court? Uh, I do think, uh, you know, Madison was very concerned about factionalism and wrote a famous uh, Federalist paper about that. And his uh, solution was, uh, to try to create enough factions that no one uh, of them uh, could dominate all of the others. Uh, I do wonder if they really had the ability to imagine uh, the kind of sharp partisanship uh, that we experience today. And they certainly, uh, I, I don't think at least Madison would not have liked the idea of uh, this very strong two-party system that we have. And maybe it's better than a multi-party system in some ways, but uh, I don't think they would have imagined it to be that way at least. And I always think of Jefferson uh, wanting to amend the constitution or, or rewrite the constitution every 20 years. And I think of that in, in light of uh, current uh, constitutional conflicts of, of how impossible that would be for, for us today. That's just a reflection. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So I think this will be our, our last question, but the Stalin use of language has changed over time. Does that seem to impact the way citizens understand the thoughts of founders today, the founders today? Sorry, could you repeat that? I missed the first Part. Sure. The style and use of language has changed over time. Does that seem to impact the way citizens understand the thoughts of the founders today? I have no doubt that it does. I can't, uh, you know, think of like a concrete example, uh, but this is essentially the part of the conflict between. Uh, originalism and a living constitutionalism. The idea that you can go back and know with any degree of certainty what the, the founders thought about a particular thing, let alone uh, the entire body of people responsible for uh, you know, ratifying the constitution is, um, I think lacks some, some humility because of our distance in time. And yes, our different uh, language evolves. Uh, the constitution, I don't think, can be insulated from the uh, natural evolution of language. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Doug, again, for sharing your expertise with our community as we celebrate Constitution Day 2022. At this time, it's my privilege to announce or introduce our Vice President for 
Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Gina Casolino. Lenny, thank you so much. Um, Doug, you said, uh, you know, when we were prepping for tonight's lecture that you prefer to go by Doug, but I'm going to call you Professor Carlson because I feel like I'm back in the classroom. What a what an intellectually rigorous lecture um, you've given us so much to think about. And I love the thoughtful questions posed by our audience. Thank you so much to Lenny for moderating some, some Q&A. For those who know me well, they know that I love the power of the written and spoken word. And Professor Carlson, you... Colson, excuse me, you have given us such beautiful language to ponder as we think about these foundational values of our democracy as they're understood and as they're conveyed. I've definitely got some things I need to go back and rewatch. Um, as many of our students say they like to do, rewatching the lectures on Zoom um, really can sort of help imprint the learning. So, Doug, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. It's been, it's been really terrific. As we wrap up our program, I do wanna recognize the partnership as has been um, referenced by Dean Webster at the, at the beginning of our program, our partnership with the libraries and student affairs to bring this annual event to our community. Our libraries serve as a physical and a spiritual home base to convene and deeply explore the intellectual issues of the day. And as Professor Colson has lifted up, there, there really couldn't be more important issues of the day that we're, that we're living through um, in this period of history. And likewise, in student affairs, we are committed to the holistic development of our students, including a lifelong commitment to intellectual curiosity. And tonight's been a great opportunity to provide, oppor to provide opportunity for all of us to do just that. Thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you to the teams from the university libraries, from student affairs, and of course our featured speaker, Doug Coulson for bringing us tonight's program. We're so pleased that you all could join us and we look forward to seeing you again at next year's Constitution Day program. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you all.